All right, guys. Um, all right, here we go. Uh, thank you, one and all, for coming. I can't really see you. They put the lights so bright. There could be any number of people in here. Um, but for those of you that have come out to watch my presentation, it's truly humbling. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a lot of awesome stuff on today at the expo. Um, so to, for, to choose what I'm talking about uh, is a very humbling experience for me. I have been skydiving 35 and a half years. Uh, since, uh, yeah, I know, right? I look, look only 25. But uh, I've been skydiving 35 and a half years, and one of the, the first things I noticed on the drop zone was the camera flyer, even though it was a Cessna drop zone, was doing more jumps than anyone else. So in about 88, I was on static line, being put out of the plane, and then going to my local electronics store to check out video cameras on static line. And everyone laughed at me. But I had my vision, I had my dream, I had my, uh, I had my focus on being a camera flyer. Um, my name's Andy Ford, by the way, Fordy. Andrew, for those that can't pronounce Fordy. Uh, so that my presentation is basically about my 35 years in the sport, my passions in the sport, what inspires me, and what I hope inspires you when you look at pictures and videos. Because my job, and the photographers and videographers throughout the UK and the world, is not to make you look good. You look good when you're up in the sky. We do such a cool thing, man, it's so beautiful. My job is to capture that moment that you make look good so that people that don't do what we do look at what we do in an amazing way and go, wow. Right, let's see if I can work everything. Right, this is one of the very few pictures of me. I very rarely get in front of the lens, um, so I thought I'd use it. Let me just get rid of this Wi-Fi, there we go. Um, so what is camera flying? Well, I want a quick show of hands. Who jumps a GoPro in our sport? Look at that. That's, that's a good sort of 80% who has jumped a GoPro. Um, who jumps a GoPro and a stills camera? Yeah, so we've still got a fair few people. And those of you that jump a stills camera, do you have multiple lenses? Put your hands up if you have multiple lenses, if you just stick to one lens, okay? So each and every one of us at some point through the accessibility of action cameras and the accessibility of lightweight cameras will jump camera and capture our friends in the sport at some point. And how far you want to take it is totally up to you. All right, so for me, this is the kind of list of types of uh, videography and photography I could think of. So you film your mate's point of view. You may film a team, filming tandems, filming the bigger groups, you may get invited to boogies and events. Then you might get invited to the record attempts. Then you might get invited on those one-off events, which for me are the most interesting. And then there's the TVs and movies that we watch and see our own sport portrayed uh, and, and get excited about. So before any of this, obviously, when you start off, you're going to need your brief. You're going to read the camera manual uh, if it's available to you. Chat to the guys on the drop zone who've always got the biggest, biggest amount of camera kit. Uh, and that you basically recognise as people that could mentor you. If possible, once you've found that mentor, hound that person constantly for knowledge. Okay, It's the only way you're going to learn and become uh, better. Also YouTube. I've learned a lot of my stuff off YouTube. Uh, I think I've been filming for 32 years, and for the first 12 years I had no clue. I was still on good stuff. I was still filming and taking photographs of good stuff. I had no clue. Um, and, I, and I bluffed my way through. YouTube helped me a lot. And um, it's, in, it's a, a good source of endless information. And like I say, find a mentor or just message me, message other photographers and you know, get looked after. So the different events uh, or the different types of skydiving that I've been uh, Lucky to guest on for photography, formation skydiving, big wave formation, wingsuit, artistic in freestyle, free flying sky surf, tracking and angle, canopy flocking and canopy formation, and of course the tandem and AFF trap. Uh, the reason I've done all that is because I've been around a long time. Basically, that just says to you that I'm old. Um, I couldn't think of a better way to spend my time in the sky than uh, than making uh, making these beautiful pictures but they all res require a slightly different skill set and a different aspect uh, of both flying and photography. Okay, I'm going to go a little bit technical for you, for those of you that do jump a stills camera. The faster the discipline moves through the sky, the faster your shutter speed has to be to capture it. 
Okay, so if your body's moving through the sky at 160 mile an hour, it's very difficult to keep your head still. If your body's moving through the sky on a wingsuit or you're on a CF jump under canopy, then it's much easier. You can have a lower shutter speed. We're not going to get too technical because I might lose someone, but I don't want to bore the people that do have nice camera setups. Okay, the longer the lens you use, if you're using a wide angle lens, you can go with a slower shutter speed. Now, if you think about, uh, if you look through a toilet roll, or even a longer sort of uh, sort of kitchen roll, the, the harder it is, like a telescope, it's harder to keep it still. You need a higher shutter speed with the longer lens, otherwise you're gonna start to blur that image. Okay, we're not gonna go too technical into it, but that is part of it. Um, all right, the first one. What do you need to film your mates in the sky with your point of view camera? Super easy. Action camera, there we go. Everyone starts with an action camera, be it a GoPro, be it a 360, or a variant of. You need your helmet upgraded with a cutaway, super simple. You get someone to do that. Um, and you need an audible altimeter. I don't know if that's in the ops manual. You need to have an audible because it's easy to lose focus when you're focusing on other people. And your skill set doesn't really need to differ from that of a skill set of somebody who's not filming, because your point of view, you're part of the skydive. It should be fit and forget. You should be out there, flummy mates. And at the end of the day, having a look at your footage, putting it on Instagram and whatever. Um, for me, this is probably some of the most joy you can get out of filming is no pressure skydiving, plenty of mates filming and then swapping it afterwards. I do have photos of most of this, but I couldn't find any images or footage of me flying with mates. Okay, <laughs> but we'll come on to that. I do actually have some footage on Hi8 and DV tape, but I don't have any way of putting it onto a screen. Almost all of my photography is of my mates, if I'm honest, because that is the beauty of our sport. I've, very, I've never jumped, uh, apart from maybe some movie stuff where I didn't know the people I was filming, I've never jumped with people that I wouldn't call my mates. So it is, uh, it's part of the sport. So now we move on and we've got the next of our groups, filming an FS team. I filmed an FS team for a long time myself. We're going to need the action camera, the helmet with the cutaway and audible. Now we're getting a little more professional. So we're going to need to have that spare micro SD card. I've left cards in computers after debriefs. It's embarrassing. But no one knows if you've got one in the helmet and you can pop it in. Okay, Keep those mistakes to yourself. You might need a wingsuit or a wing jacket uh, and a ring sight. Ooh, that's, a, that's a contentious issue whether you need a ring sight or not. Uh, and a backup rig. I know it's not a camera thing, but uh, if you're going to start filming teams, going to start going on training camps, then you're going to need to uh, maybe back up those loads. Um, so your ring sight, at this stage, if you've got a wide-angle lens, you may not need a ring sight. But if you're starting to jump with a slightly longer lens, you're going to need more accuracy. Think uh, shotgun will shoot in a wide, and that's your wide-angle lens. But a rifle, you need a, a scope on the top. Okay, And the longer that rifle, the further you're shooting over, the better your optics need to be. So for me... Um, I never, ever jump without a ring sight. All right, let's just... All right, it's going to just shoot through some pictures. You'll notice these are... Some of them are from above, and I find these pictures fairly boring, if I'm honest. But if you're filming a team, you are locked in to taking video and photographs from a judgeable angle. This is more artistic, because I'm not the primary photographer. If I'm underneath it, it's because I'm not the primary photographer. Uh, I did film underneath once in a competition. I was asked not to do it again. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you'll see some of these are just, they're nice shots, but they're, they're not shots that are gonna make it into your, into your, uh, your best shots um, from my point of view. And of course, this is a very subjective discipline, photography and uh, videography. So then we move on to filming tandems. Okay, when you're filming tandems, you're now going to need two action cameras, maybe. You need a spare camera and a stills camera. Or you may work on a drop zone that works with stills uh, off of a GoPro or action camera. Stills release, so a vacuum switch or bite switch if you're jumping with a stills camera. Your bespoke camera helmet now. We can't get away with jumping with a, a, a G3, G4, G35, whatever, uh, and a little bracket on the top. We now need to have something a little more professional. Uh, if you've got two cameras, you need two spare cards. I actually have about five spare cards all over my camera helmet and inside it, so never get caught out. You need an audible and you need your jacket still. And uh, there's that contentious ring sight again. Um, you now have to meet a product criteria. Your drop zone will set the minimum criteria uh, and that's standard and your, your chief of camera at your drop zone. I've worked at drop zones where there is a PDF uh, sheet. You stick to that PDF sheet every time. If you deviate from that, you're back on tandems and then you have to re um, uh, get yourself back onto the camera team uh, in your own time. 
okay? That's fairly hardcore. It doesn't happen, especially in the UK. Um, but yeah, it, it can get quite hardcore when you're filming tandems. I would also like to say that this stage of skydiving, if you get into tandem videography, is a trap. You may never get beyond this. Okay, it's like an infinite loop. You go to the drop zone, you earn some nice money with the lure of payment for a fun skydive, and it satisfies your needs. You walk away from the drop zone with three, four hundred pound in your pocket. Every day you're there, and it's like, boof, I'm, I'm, I'm made. Um, thank you to Mike Frost for possibly saving me from this infinite loop with his sky surfboard and sexy dreadlocks back in 1997. Okay, he was doing something that caught my attention. Uh, we got together, and I... It was a big deal to stop earning that big money. It was my secondary job. I was in the Air Force, but I was earning four, five hundred pounds, six hundred pounds a weekend. And to stop doing that, to go and film something, and Mike did not pay me. We'll talk about that later. Um, to, to be not paid to do something uh, and go to it because it is exciting is, is what it's all about. So we're going to have a look at some of the photos. Yes, here we go. Um, outside camera's lovely because you get that... that Beautiful artistic option. Obviously, we've all seen tandem shots. Nice to have a blurry background. I'm into my blurry background. And you'll see a lot of camera flyers now learn to fly in a sit position. You don't need to fly in a sit position. I did thousands of tandem videography jumps with um, on a belly. I did find that when I was with a 100 plus kilogram student and a 100 plus kilogram tandem instructor, I could feel it for a few days afterwards. If you're in a sit, you don't. It's much easier, but that's, um, that's, that's very personal. We then move on. We've got the organized groups. If we see Ali Milne's group here. Ali Milne, I did uh, shout you out. So Ali's, Ali Milne's groups are lovely. I sometimes get invited along to uh, film these. They're great fun. Okay, So when you get onto the organized groups, then you definitely need action camera. Maybe your stills camera, depending what the, um, what the, the outcome is, desired outcome is. Helmet with cutaway, spare micro SD card, second audible is very important now. You start focusing a lot when you're getting into this. A um, lot going on, very easy to lose your focus of your altitude, and so a second audible for me. I have two, one talks uh, and one beeps. It's opened up a whole new world, the talking automator. Um, so yeah, definitely uh, I like my talking automator. It's very easy if you do a lot of disciplines, wingsuit, free fly, belly flying, that you're always changing your beeps and your altitudes and they just kind of become irrelevant. You hear a beep, and it's like you then have to work out in your head if you're focusing on something, whether you're on a free fly jump, what beep that would be, and sometimes that can kind of get lost, where if it's just saying 6,000, 5,000, 4,000, um, then definitely, for me, it's a game changer. You also need a very high level of skill in the discipline you're filming. Okay, if you're going on to uh, a nice free fly jump or a wingsuit jump, and you're outside that jump film in the group, you need to be doing whatever the group is doing at least to the level they're doing it at. And that doesn't mean you have to fly in and be able to dock 50th on a 50-way head down, but it does mean you have to be able to transition at 160 miles an hour. You do need, do need to be able to approach at high speed. You do need to be able to stop. There is a lot going on here, and you do not want to be thinking about flying at any stage when you are flying. If you're thinking about flying, maybe you shouldn't have a camera on your head. Some of the pictures from beautiful Langer. Uh, they put some amazing organized groups together. Second shot of me, which I'm quite pleased with, from a wingsuit camp earlier in the year. And then uh, groups of free flyers of all skill sets, uh, all levels. I like to capture from multiple angles as well, so I shoot steep from above and below. Boom. All right, so we've moved on. We're now going on to boogies and events. Boogies and events. Oh, sorry, I'm just going to. No, don't do that. Nope, it's too late. So boogies and events, um, you've got to liaise with the load organiser and the other camera flyers. You might be part of a multiple camera group. Um, you've got to be able to edit quickly for your debriefs and possibly put together a day tape at the end um, if, it's, uh, if it's just a single camera. Uh, if you've got the skills and the equipment, then this is a great way to improve because people generally pay your slot uh, and you're getting... The, the fun of jumping with the group at the same time as uh, being able to trade and apply your, your trade, your art, uh, and show people what you can do. Everybody loves a photo. Everyone wants their stuff on Instagram. So these groups are super important uh, for your evolution in flying. Hopefully some of the pictures you'll see and you'll like. I do a lot of soft focus with long lenses. Uh, some of them are wide angle. 
these are things you can't do with a GoPro. You cannot uh, get these nice depths of field. Hey, we've got Jamie super sharp and the four-way out of focus. You can't get these depth of field with a with a, a GoPro, and they don't really have the uh, the dynamic range to do it in post either. So you, you don't get a good uh, even in Photoshop. It's very difficult to make a GoPro photo look different than a GoPro photo. You will find that if you've got one person sharp and ten people out of focus, you will have ten people moan at you. <laughs> so you know, take lots of pictures. So boogies and events. All right, now it gets professional because uh, we've got everything on the helmet now. Action camera, backup camera, stills camera, maybe a 360. Another lens might stop changing up your lenses to longer lenses. All your spare cards, spare goggles. Don't forget your spare goggles. It's embarrassing when you put your goggles on and they snap. Um, and you're on running. Your stills release, whether it be a vacuum switch or whether it be uh, a bite switch. Uh, and if you're at a boogie, a spare vacuum switch, bite switch, or whatever. I went to a boogie in Tesla. I drove there. I had all my equipment. And because I drove, I thought I've got absolutely everything I need. And on day two, my vacuum switch broke. I've never had any problems with it. It'd been in my helmet for 15 years. And it broke at the boogie. And I shot video on a really nice, high-performance photography camera for the rest of the week. And I was so upset with myself. Um, the footage was lovely because I had some great lenses and, and I just enjoyed the flying and it took the pressure off, but I had no photos after day two. Definitely two audibles and then anything you need to wear to get the shot. Um, the skill set for the discipline involved, same as we did last time. Uh, possibly a backup rig, but generally when you find you're on a um, on groups, it's, it's, it's not a turn load, so you're, uh, you can get away with having a packer. You generally get a little bit more flexibility with um, artistic shots on groups. Okay, People don't mind. You're not there to be judged or you're not there for judges to look at the group. So you might find that you can just fly around, take shots, put the sun where you want it. You can't put the sun anywhere it's there. You can put the formation in front of the sun where you want it uh, and you can make things look as artistic and beautiful as you want. Um, and you can start changing it up with lenses, changing it up, wearing the flash, making uh, your photography or your videography, whatever you want to do. Um, your thing. There's, a, there's an amazing video out there, Against the Grain. I don't know if you've seen it. It's worth finding a copy. And it's my inspirational video that I look at when I kind of get a little jaded with doing a lot of camera jumps. And I watch it, and the guys switch back and fly angles and let stuff fall through the frame like B-roll. And I watch that, and I want to go to the drop zone and film. Okay, That's my go-to, Against the Grain. And it's, it's been around for years, but it is a beautiful uh, video. You might find on the groups also that you're asked to do the ground shots. Uh, it's all good fun um, because the team want pictures of themselves in front of the aircraft and that sort of stuff. Like I said, the limitations of the GoPro really do stand out here uh, and you need to start working with more professional camera equipment. Right, here we go. Action camera, stills camera, GoPro release, bespoke camera helmet, all the stuff we've talked about. <laughs> Skill set for record attempts, here we go. So you don't need to be able to take the grips on the record, but you definitely need to fly uh, as good as anyone else on the record. We're going to show some pictures now of um, some skydives that I was involved in in 2023. The Euro 104-way um, women's record. It was a fantastic event at Langer. Langer sequential event. Now, during these doesn't matter how many skydives you've got. I've got a fair few under my belt, and I've been on a fair few jumps that are quite high pressured. The performance anxiety on filming a record is far above anything else. That and that and national and world level um, competition. You get to a point where, I mean, I, I have sleepless nights when I'm coming up to record attempts and when I'm coming up to competitions, because I care, basically. Um, I wake up living my worst moment. I wake up living my best moment. Um, of the records that you're going to be involved in, I'm going to shoot. Uh, I'm going to shoot you onto a video when this finishes, um, while I talk about the performance anxiety and the perf the pressure of being a, a videographer um, on one of these records. Please, I need some tissues. This gets quite emotional. I'm going to shoot the. Uh, this is not a great weather jump, but it is one of the 104 way jumps. You'll notice that I leave the plane about seven seconds before anyone else. I didn't fall out. I was asked to do this. It's the loneliest I've ever been on in free fall, <laughs> and I've done solos. Okay, this was the most horrendous place to be on a skydive. I'm doing 170 miles per hour. I'm heading towards not the base, which is something visual to head towards. 
I'm heading towards a space beneath the base that I have to guess. It's doing 165 to 170 miles an hour. You can see the other photographer on it who's low. I'm the only record photographer. The other guy's flying artistic camera. So it, if I don't do the job, there is no record of this jump. So at 170 mile an hour, I flip to a head up. Now I drive to get underneath it, right to the center. I want this steep. It's a little bit messy, huh? I can't get away from it at this point. At 170 mile an hour, I don't have another gear. So I have to get to the point where I'm in the right place. Otherwise, I'm stuck. So if I'm too close and I'm cropping the frame, there is nothing to do, OK? And apart from the fact that I'm opening the door, I'm letting the pilot know that the oxygen's come on OK, I'm checking all my cameras, checking my settings, I'm laid on the floor looking at the other planes, and then I, when the guy climbs out of the other plane, I get up and tell our base that we're ready, then I climb out and my job starts. Your workload can really exceed your mental capacity, or maybe that's just me. Um, but your workload can be incredibly high, you have to then have a really good um, sort of repetitive schedule. When do I turn my cameras on? I cannot tell you how many times I've turned my cameras on and then they've been on for a while and then I turn them off because I forgot to turn them on and then someone's gone, you've turned your cameras off. And I was like, turn my cameras on because I'm a professional and then I've got out. Okay, And it's easy to do, so you have to do the same thing every time over and over and over and over, which means that when I'm on a record, People think I'm a little bit sullen or a little bit moody because I don't really speak to people. I'm in a bubble. And I'm in a bubble because I don't want to get the job wrong, right? Everything is um, everything is is riding on this for me. No one wants to let down 104 people after they've um, after they've uh, paid good money to travel to another country to get a record. Irrelevant of whether the record is successful, uh, I have to perform. So one-off events, now these are my favorites. So this is a uh, demo into a place in the UAE called Global Village. It's like uh, Alton Towers on steroids. Um, there's everything there you could possibly imagine. It was for a UAE uh, record. And I decided I would be, I would take photos because that's what I do. It's one of those things that you, you, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So I put my camera helmet on with a 360 camera, two, uh, two GoPros, my stills camera. I didn't use flash because we had pyro, which lights everything up. Um, and I said to the guy, do you mind if I don't wear the pyro because I kind of, I've got quite a lot going on. And he said, take the camera off, wear the pyro. Yeah. It was more important for him that I had the fireworks on to look good from the ground than it was that they had video footage from the outside. And I thought, you're never going to get another chance at this, Forty. So and I don't always talk to myself like that, but I'm never going to get another chance at this. So I put the camera on with the pyro and the LEDs in the suit and off we went. And it worked out okay. I had everything on my head at that point. There's nothing else I could have got on uh, my head for that shot. Um, you need the skills in both the fly and the discipline and composing the shot. This is uh, another, this isn't the global demo video, but it's, uh, it's another video of a night jump. Uh, I didn't have fireworks on this one, which is good. Uh, I wear red goggles for night jumps um, because it means that those pyros don't burn out my uh, night vision and I can focus better. Although when you put red goggles on at night, people think you're a bit mad. Uh, I use the clear goggles during the day if it's a little bit cloudy and if it's really poor weather. Uh, in other words, UK skydiving sometimes. I wear the yellow goggles for a bit of clarity. So if you see me with different color goggles on, it's not uh, it's not because I'm trying to look uh, Austin Powers and fancy. I'm just uh, trying to get the best view I possibly can. So this is the 11th anniversary skydive at uh, Skydive Dubai. Weirdly enough, they never used any of this footage. They never published any of it. It's kind of a waste of time. Uh, apart from the fact it was a fun, unforgettable moment. I'm flying through the fireworks, which is great, because if you've never had fireworks hit you in the face in free fall, you have not lived. <laughs> uh, I was very honored to be part of the uh, team that put this together. Myself and Darren Book put this skydive together. Ever. You can see some of the pyros didn't work. I made sure that everyone had LEDs in the suit so that at least when the pyros started to disappear, I still had some light. And, uh, and, and then the photos change. Every photo changes because everyone's suit is changing uh, over and over and over. We got out on a crosswind leg um, four and a half miles away from the drop zone from 10 or 11,000 feet. We went out in a normal wingsuit pattern, left, 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 uh, built it, 
and we just flew it in a straight line and it was a most fantastic experience. I've seen the footage from the ground and it is mind blowing. Um, and the footage from the air wasn't too bad either. Good break off plan, everyone's safe. I pull nice and high on these. There's no point taking it down on these. I like to be out, out of there early. So as you see, when they break off and the wings break off left and right, uh, I'll just flare up and pull. And I let the boys in the base crack on down low. The pyros last about two minutes. And you can see how immediately people just start to disappear when the pyros disappear. A lot of pressure on these jumps. I'm the only photographer. A um, lot of pressure on this. I'm not the only photographer now, am I? <laughs> so I'm the only photographer on the jump. There's a lot of pressure for me to get this right. Settings are super important. If you're jumping at night, it's very easy not to have enough light. So you have to have a very low shutter speed. Okay, for those of you that are photographers, shutter speed is how fast the picture allows the uh, allows the light onto the sensor. The slower you do it, the more light hits the sensor. Okay, so it feels like there's more light in the picture. At night, I'm down to like 200th of a second. If you cannot fly at 200th of a second without your head wobbling, then you're going to get a blurry image. So you need to know, you need to practice, you need to kind of go with the, the skill set you know you have with, with your camera. So which means you've got to pay for those jumps and fly your jumps on your drop zone knowing that you might not get anything from that jump except a load of blurry pictures. But at least you'll know when the time comes what you can do and uh, how, um, how low you can go really with your shutter speed. Okay, some pictures. Um, so yeah, we talked about knowledge and understanding of our equipment and our personal skills with the shutter speeds and, uh, and the apertures on the camera. Uh, the lowest shutter speed I can fly is 200th without causing motion blur. Of course, if I'm on a free fly jump that's doing 170 mile an hour, it might be 4,000th of a second be the lowest shutter speed I can fly without blurring the image because you can't keep your head still at 170 miles an hour. And you also, if you've got a longer lens, you can't keep that lens still at 170 mile an hour. I've blurred shots at 3,000th of a second. So it just shows how the shutter speed is so important when you're, uh, when you're flying camera. All right, productions for the big screen. Um, if you like my snag-proof setup, I can help you build one. Um, we kind of get to the point now where there is nothing snag-proof when we're jumping this sort of equipment. You can see on the, the one on the right, it's got the, the square screen on the front. That's an ND filter, neutral density filter to assist with uh, light levels. It's taped onto a, a round lens. These are super, um, super heavy bits of equipment. So this category is easily the most elusive because it's a nice sideline. You get paid well, but you can never rely upon it. You don't know whether you're going to get one, two, three movies in a year or no movies for two years. Production companies use skydiving sequences for the most action-packed uh, moments in their movies. And as skydivers, we love to see our sport portrayed on the big screen. Although sometimes we can be a little bit under-impressed with the finished product. That's not the photographer. That's generally down to uh, overuse of CGI or a lot of the stuff that you thought looked good ends up on the cutting room floor. Blame the director. James Bond, Mission Impossible, King's Batman, to name a few of the movies that are well-known. Uh, TV series such as Navy Seals, Scorpion, and UK productions such as Hollyoaks Extra, Top Gear, The Coroner, have all featured our sport. Every time you see our sport, whether you think it's portrayed well or not, um, someone sees our sport and they're thinking about skydiving. And for me, that's, um, that's the name of the game. Uh, just a, a short one, The Aeronauts I shot, which was an Eddie Redmayne and Amelia Wren movie for Amazon. Uh, and all they wanted me to do was shoot cloud plates. Go out and shoot clouds. It's, like, it's the UK, I got this. And, uh, and I sat on the drop zone during the day, every day, and it was cloudy. It was beautiful. It was typical British skydiving weather. There's lots of clouds, but they didn't want me to jump until the golden hour, that time of the evening when it's all beautiful and orange and peachy colours. And as we got to the golden hour, and I'm like, let's go. I got the camera kit, got it all gone, went down, got on the aeroplane and took off, and the clouds evaporated every day. And it was embarrassing because I got the director of photography there and I'm like, dude, dude, it was like, what can I do? And they're paying me, you know, so there is an upside. Um, but there's nothing I could do about it. And they didn't want to fix it in post. They wanted to shoot during the golden hour. And in the end, I ended up finding a cloud out of what was left. It's like candy floss melting in the heat. And uh, I was a little way off the drop zone when I got out. And my buddy's like, are you sure you're getting out of here? And I'm like, yeah, I'm getting out of here. I've just got to get that cloud. Um, and so I ended up 
with um, yeah shooting a massive camera at a small cloud with the drop zone uh, in the background. And uh, yeah, I can't tell you whether I landed off. It's a secret. So the action camera. You might use an action camera. Um, action camera just for your own personal stuff. You're not going to be able to get to keep show real stuff shot on the, the red cameras and the other big cameras. Uh, your main camera is generally supplied, supplied by production. It's pointless going out and spending 50 grand on camera kit that's going to be obsolete in two years' time. They bring these cameras out so quickly, they're very expensive. Uh, your bespoke camera helmet, big plate, two audibles. You've got to dress in whatever it takes. I've jumped wingsuit with these red cameras and it's horrible. Um, and you're going to need a ring sight. Soft opening canopy. Canopy choice is so important with camera flying. Um, and a neck brace. You might see me on the airplane, put my neck brace on, doubles as a, a neck warmer as well, so that's fine. There's nothing down, there's no downside in having a neck brace, okay? I jump one for all of my photography. I don't want the opening that ends my career when I'm jumping with a heavy camera helmet. The skill set for this is beyond what you think you require for the job. You don't just go along to this job and think, yeah, I could probably get that. You need to over deliver on these jobs um, because they're very quick to not bother with skydiving again if they get poor footage. It's there somewhere. Oh, there it is. So, yeah, that's a red camera. Um, main issue of this camera for this type of equipment with a lens coming in at over two kilograms and the body and the battery and sometimes um, two cameras is you've got anything up to nine kilograms on your head. I don't know if you've ever balanced nine kilograms on your head. Um, when you jump out of a plane with nine kilos, if you're in a sit or you're on your belly, it's generally okay. When they ask you to do fairly high speed stuff, it becomes incredibly difficult. Uh, and that's where you're earning your money. They're not aerodynamic at all. And uh, for flying a wingsuit, they're an absolute beast. The cost of this equipment goes into the tens of thousands. The lenses are thousands and thousands of pounds. But like I say, it's, it's, um, it's not your kit. It's insured by production. And so luckily it kind of takes that pressure off you for uh, having that kit on your head. Like I say, you can't uh, keep the footage yourself. So IMDB and YouTube are really good places for you to go and uh, find stuff afterwards to put it on your website and that sort of stuff. Right, I'm, going to talk about the, I'm going to talk about the dangers of camera flying uh, and how to mitigate them. Uh, to be fair, I think some of them are fairly obvious. Altitude awareness, uh, free fall collision, and canopy collision. All right, altitude awareness, well, audible set for whatever you need to do. And you do need to get out of there as soon as possible. So it's pointless uh, going lower than you need to be. Visual cues, if you're on a big way, whether it be a head down, head up, wingsuit or whatever, uh, or even four-way and eight-way. When someone leaves that formation, your job is done. You cannot capture that formation if someone has left. Okay? Yes, your videographer, your LO might want um, a break-off shot for debrief. Um, you can kind of get that as you're getting into the saddle and watching people track away. For me, I like to get out of there as soon as possible. Communication is key. Brief break-off plan, pull altitudes, including headings, if you've got multiple camera flyers. Uh, shoot stuff with um, two other cameramen when I'm at Langer. One of us is on the top, one of us is on the bottom in the sit, and one of them's kind of flying around the edge, taking some beautiful pictures, sunsets, all the arty-farty stuff. Top guy pulls in the middle immediately. Bottom guy has to wait. The bottom slot is, uh, is, is, is quite a, it's quite a, a technical shot. Um, the guy in the middle generally turns 180 short track and pulls at the correct altitude. Uh, the guy on the bottom has to wait for the hole in the middle to appear. Um, sometimes that can take a while. While you're doing that, you're going lower. While you're going lower, then you're losing, uh, you're losing altitude. So it's super important you stick to your hard deck. Okay? Have, that, uh, have multiple audibles uh, and you need to kind of keep on your altitude. Uh, I'll be absolutely fair, I don't look at an altimeter while I am doing camera work. There is not one record I've ever been on where you'll see me look away and look back or put my hand in front of here. Yes, I've got one there, um, but again, you can't really see that while you're flying. Multiple audibles is, is definitely, um, definitely important. So free fall collisions, be where you're expected to be. That's kind of a no-brainer. If you're top left on a 40-way and it's moving across the sky, that's wingsuit or it's angle, be top left, don't be bottom right. Because when they go bottom right and they split off, they're not expecting you. Super important to be where you're meant to be. High degree of awareness during the break-off, um, angles of the flyers. 
if you can't see everyone in the formation, like if you're on a 20-way wingsuit and you can only see 17 people, or approximately 17 people, you know there's a coloured wingsuit missing or someone's missing, you've got to be super aware. They could be behind you. If you're going to break out in a certain direction, then you have to be very aware. Uh, and then under canopy, if you can pull high, pull high. Get yourself, um, do, all your, do all your housework on your slider, turn your cameras off, take your booties off, unclip your wings, do all the things you need to do whilst keeping an eye around you, okay? I can't tell you the amount of times I've had uh, someone have a 180 degree off heading opening, fly back to the middle, or someone uh, pull a little bit high on a short track, uh, and I've got lots of video, which I'm not put on here, of some fairly close calls. Um, it's going to happen, that's it. There's no way around it. Uh, it is going to happen, but plan for the worst and be on your game. Uh, head on a swivel from pitch in the pilot shoot until you walk into the camera room. Um, it's pointless doing a really good job and then getting hit on the landing area because you're not watching what you're doing. Camera equipment, risk, or, uh, risk versus reward. Well, a little heads up. This is the cost of my camera equipment. Now, this is very personal. You don't have to buy the best equipment there is available on the market. And to be fair, this has been superseded anyway. But my helmet is a bonehead flat top pro. It's about 700 pounds, probably more with the import. Two and a half grand for my camera body. My lenses range anywhere from 1600 to two grand. My flash, 250. My GoPros are 350 each, aren't they? Something like that, if you're, if you're part of the program. 360 cameras, another 350. Uh, you're audible. If you think about getting rid of uh, that helmet, your audibles are 250 quid each. Um, and then you've got a ring sight. My ring sight is a concentric ring sight. It's the old style version. You just can't find them. So for me, it's it's uh, it's irreplaceable with the bracket, at least 300 pounds. Stills release 60 pounds. All your media cards, if you jump in as many cameras as you can, then um, your media cards add up as well. Mine's just over seven grand. Right. It's the risk versus the reward. If I'm shooting video and I'm shooting stills that are only going to be used for Instagram, social media, um, and digital magazines, then I have to start thinking to myself, is it worth me jumping this equipment, or could I get away with something uh, slightly less quality? Only you can answer that as, uh, as, a, as a photographer. I absolutely 100% I've had to change my mentality and jump photography for myself. I, I, want you guys to have beautiful pictures and I want to see my pictures in the magazines so that when people look at it they go that's really nice but actually I want to take pictures for me because there's it, it's not really uh, it's not really a viable income and also you've got to think to yourself is it insurable and will I cut this away so with this camera helmet on your head you've got to cut away and it's for a reason okay there have been a couple of fatalities over the years where people have had issues with their camera equipment and they haven't cut them away um, because they couldn't or they haven't. There's a lad who landed in the water uh, in Norway, still had his camera helmet on. Um, you've got to think to yourself, right, at what point am I willing to get rid of seven grand that isn't insured all my life? And people don't like to cut their parachute equipment with knives. They don't like to get rid of camera equipment because I think as human beings, it's just like, I don't, I, I don't want to lose this, right? But if you're going to start jumping this sort of equipment, then uh, you have to weigh up that risk versus reward. All right, so any questions from you? We've got some pictures to look at, but there's any questions from you now uh, about photography. I have some rhetorical questions. Where do you think skydiving's gonna go in the next five years in relation to photography? With AI being able to do most of the things we need, um, I can change the background on a skydive, and I might have done so at Langer for the team picture. It was quite cloudy. We didn't go and jump, just saying that. Um, we went back and had a coffee, but we went out. While we did a dirt dive, we did the team picture. And then I changed it to a blue sky with some nice puffy clouds like in The Simpsons. And it took me three seconds. Years ago, it would have taken me a week. Um, but it took me three seconds to do that in Photoshop. So nowadays, depth of field, that soft blurry background, um, do we need to buy the, the expensive lenses? Do we need to have the ones that are super fast, nice apertures? Because maybe we can do it in post. Will flash, I jump flash. Not many people jump flash, but I like the flash uh, on some of the images, especially late in the evening. Will flash be superseded again by the amount of dynamic range, which is the whites and the blacks, how much you can bring them out. I can shoot a picture in here with no flash and almost make it look daylight afterwards because the cameras are such good quality. Do we need flash anymore? Do we need to load up all these camera helmets uh, with, all the, uh, with all the groovy expensive kit? Okay, got some pictures. These are, I can kind of talk you through them. These are from, I thought I'd made them go faster than this. Yeah. 
Uh, these are from various records. Bit of an idea of depth of field. I jumped the white one, not the small one. Some, uh, some guys at Hinton. Now jumping with flash in the evening, getting that beautiful sunset. sunset. Definite flash on uh, a late evening jump. The Langer sequentials. Now when you're doing sequential, when we're doing records, it used to be you had one point and you took the shot, high shutter speed, and you got the shot from when the last person looked like they were getting on to when the first person broke off. Okay, I don't generally do that. I like a, a slower shutter speed. I like to pick my shots. Problem is we now have sequential jumps. If you're doing four points on a sequential jump, you need a shot of the point, a shot of the break, a shot of the point, a shot of the break. So now we need up to eight pictures for the judges. Those eight pictures, you have to get all eight, otherwise you don't get a record. Um, and so now you have to shoot high speed. You have to wait for that moment, shoot a couple of pictures here and there if you think they look nice, but your job is to capture those few seconds. If you go too early and you fill your memory card up and your camera buffers, you're now not shooting anything, but you don't know it. So you've got to be fairly smart in what you shoot. Lots of different um, disciplines, different people, making them, uh, making them nice pictures. Some from the ground, some wingsuit flyers over the wheel. You can see their massive depth of field on that. I just wanted the, the guy to pop out. It was for his sponsor. Uh, and I wanted Nick to pop out in the um, picture. So if you don't know how that works, depth of field is where you have a really fast aperture, which is like a very low number, 1.1, 1.4, 1.8, 2.2. .2. And that means that everything past the thing you're focusing on starts to go out of focus very quickly. And I think that makes the background um, blurry to a point where the foreground pops out. Some places are ugly, let's be fair. I've jumped in Z Hills, sorry Z Hills, but the backdrop there is <laughs> messy. And when you have a lot of people over that backdrop, it's very difficult to see the difference between the backdrop and the people that are in the, sky, in the photo. So for me, um, blurring it out slightly, you can still see where you are. It's like if there's an iconic, like the palm, you still see where you are. But at least uh, everyone who's in the skydive kind of pops out uh, in the foreground. For me, that's a nicer, that's a nicer photo. should have seen the landing. <laughs> what is it going? If anyone has any questions, feel free to shout out. We've got someone who's coming around with a mic. Um, Dave Francis, got something to say? What's your favourite discipline of photography? What do you enjoy the most? I don't really have a favourite. My favourite is the one I'm doing at the time. Um, the one off events. It, it, it is. Hey! It, it is. It's. I, I, uh, yeah, I like those because if you're doing a demo and you're jumping over water and it's nine o'clock at night and it's pitch black and there's fireworks and LEDs and you've got. Yeah, it's amazing. But if you're underneath a hundred way, that's also an amazing but terrifying place to be. And if you're, if you're shooting pictures, I've come down and shot pictures of one person and that picture's been beautiful and that person's happy. I've had magazine covers where I know that that has landed on their doorstep. There's a German lady I shot pictures of in Portugal. That picture on the front of their German free flash magazine landed on her doorstep and she didn't know that she was gonna be in the magazine. I didn't know she was gonna be on the cover. And she messaged me I was like, 40, they've stolen your picture. <laughs> I was like, no, I actually put it to the magazine. And she was so pleased that it, it made everything I do worthwhile. So, yeah, whatever I'm doing is good. Right, that's our last picture. So, Dave, what's your... Uh, what's, who else had a... Who else had a... Um, maximum weight at Sheffield. I kind of know maximum weight so far. I've not found anything I haven't jumped. I jumped a 35 mil camera a few years ago. I reckon that must have been about... 12, 13 K. I jumped it twice. It was an Arai camera with spools on and I hated it. And they also, I had goggles on it with a little TV camera in it. So my depth <laughs> perception, I was meant to be watching what was on this here. It was horrible. Um, but if you look at people like Tom Sanders, um, even I think that's some of the stuff they jump is ridiculous. And they're not, they're not youngsters either. I mean, I'm 
Uh, you know, I'm over 50. Some of these guys are 60, 65 years old, and they're still jumping with huge amounts of weight. But complete respect. Um, but yeah, I, so I just mitigate the risk with the with the neck brace and the slow opening canopy. Most photogenic drop zone. Um, one of the most beautiful drop zones isn't actually a drop zone. I jumped at Bolt Head in Devon. It was for the coroner. And we got down there and it was coastal, all the coast of Devon. Uh, there was a, a beautiful inlet which was full of yachts and everything. And it was absolutely stunning. Partly it was, it was nice that no one else was ever going to get to jump there. We did that and it was absolutely wonderful. Um, everywhere gets boring after a while, if I'm honest. Like I've shot thousands of pictures over the palm and the first ones are amazing. And then after that, it isn't. I think it's more about the subject matter. What people are doing is more important than where they are. And if you look at, like, when you first go to somewhere, if you jumped in Egypt or you've jumped at the Palm, your first few jumps, you're like, oh, my God, it's amazing. And then you've done it. You've seen it. You just, you know, you're involved with your friends. It's the same as a photographer. Of course, like I say, if you're over a drop zone that's a bit dirty or a bit messy or whatever, I just put it out of focus. Um, so, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Anyone else? Hi. I have a question over here, other side. Whoop. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, thank you for coming to talk to us. Thank you. My question for you is what is a piece of work you've been most proud of? Wow. Some of the night stuff because it's so technically difficult. Jumping at night is technically difficult, not physically with, with um, what you're doing, but actually getting it lit up properly and getting it sharp at such a low shutter speed, you'll know when I'm pleased or you'll know when I'm worried about something, whether it be a record or whether it be something. Because the second I land... I turn, make sure there's no one behind me, I bury my face in the camera. And if I'm doing this on the ground, it's because I think I might have messed up or I want to know if I haven't messed up, if that makes sense. Um, so, yeah, the more technically difficult it is, the more reward there is as a photographer. You know, you get that shot. I've never taken the perfect photo. I still strive every time. I'm my own worst critic. Um, that and Martin's my second worst critic. Um, but I, I, yeah, I can't, I can't tell you how... I plan so hard ahead. I've already got shots this year that I want, shots that I will endeavour to get by getting a group of wingsuit flyers together and a sunset at a drop zone that I know I can jump at during that time of day. I, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a never-ending journey. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm going to quickly put this up um, because these are some of the people that have inspired me. We only have a minute or so left, I think. I don't want to mess them around. Rowley Hopwood, the late Rowley Hopwood, bless him, and Tim Bishop, the guys that jumped the camera from the Cessna at Dunkerswell in 88. I saw them. I wanted to be those guys. Um, Simon Ward, 80s, 90s, amazing photographer. He ruled the magazine back then. Uh, I learned something from Simon, and I see this on Facebook when people splurge their 65 shots off of their GoPro onto their Facebook page. Only show your best work. None of us shoot perfect pictures all the time. I shoot a lot of pictures, which quickly get deleted. If you take a nice picture and you post it, people will remember you for taking that nice picture. The first picture you put into a magazine, you can guarantee if you give someone three pictures, they'll use the worst one. I don't know why, and you'll hate the fact that you put those pictures in in the first place. Only ever show people your best work. Uh, Ali Wright was, uh, Steve Fitchett, sorry. Uh, he's in Australia, he's still shooting covers. He's still an amazing Scotland photographer. We chat on Facebook a lot about flash and lenses and we inspire each other and push each other to do better. And he put me out of the Cessna in 1988 on my first static line jump, love him. Ali Wright, James Wilkinson, camera team at Weston. Gary Wainwright, Langer legend. Uh, and we still inspire each other when we get, a, get say, you know, we don't want to do stuff or whatever, we shoot in wide angle and we're doing it all the time. We push each other to do better. European photographers, Bruno and Willie, amazing photographers. Uh, Andrei Slepnev, you're a Russian. Ewan Cowie from Scotland, fantastic. Free fly angle, just beautiful Instagram. Uh, Norman Kent, obvious. Mike McGowan from Arizona, absolute legend. Doesn't jump now because of his neck, uh, sadly. Randy Forbes, you may not have heard of, but I love his work. Andy Keach did the Sky's Call cool books. And to this day, on a bad weather day, I will open the Sky's Call cool books from the 60s, 70s, 80s, and I will be inspired by some of the photos and some of the crazy stuff they do. So it's, it's out there. Um, you just need to go and find it. I just want to run this quite quickly. Andre Slepnev, I never met the guy, but I followed his Instagram for a long time. We lost Andre uh, as, a, as a community last year in Egypt at the very end of the year. His stuff was phenomenal. And I love his Instagram page. His photos are beautiful. But sadly, he lost his life on a skydive at the end of last year. 
Um, if you want to take a quick shot of that with your phone, that's his Instagram. There are so many beautiful pictures. And if you love photography, please spend a moment on Andre's uh, Instagram because that's his legacy for people that didn't know him and want to, to see his work. Um, absolutely beautiful and I feel, um, I wish I'd met him. All right, if you've got that, then that's cool. Thank you for your time. Thank you for coming and uh, listening to me, blah, 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 blah on. Uh, that's my Instagram. And I've got to be fair, I don't populate my Instagram very much. I had it hacked last year and I lost a few thousand um, photos and it kind of disappointed me that I'd been that stupid uh, to be hacked. And I haven't really populated it massively, but I will as I go through events. And I'm not really into the whole Instagram thing. I do it because I'd like people to see my work. I don't, don't care if the rest of it that goes with it. So thank you very much for your time this afternoon. I hope you have a wonderful time, Stephen.